All right, so Scream 1, 1996. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of this franchise. And look at these movies. I'm going to eventually do Scream 2, 3, and 4, because I've already done Scream 5, a review for that. And then I'd like to rank them all as kind of how I see them falling in terms of which is the best to which is the worst, or vice versa. But we definitely got to start with this one. So spoilers will be contained throughout this, by the way. But I can't really do a six-minute horror movie reviews on the Scream franchise because I like to save the six-minute horror movie reviews for stuff that's a bit more obscure. Now, obviously, Scream is a major horror franchise. So I want to go back and let's break all of these movies down in these different reviews and then come together and rank these things, similar to how I did the Halloween franchise and the Friday the 13th franchise. So let's start with this. Scream 1, all the way back in 1996, written by Kevin Williamson and directed by the late, great Wes Craven. So, the basic plot for Scream, of those of you who have not seen this 26-year-old horror classic at this point, is a small town in California called Woodsboro is having a murder spree happen, where kids from the local high school are basically getting hacked up. And it's being done by killer, a killer wearing this ghost-faced outfit. Now, this outfit is something that the movie tells us is very common. It can be found at like local gas stations and convenience stores. So it's next to impossible to track down who's doing this. That's your basic plot for Scream. You have high schoolers murdering each other. Sounds very plausible, right, in the modern age. But you have this group of teenage friends who are you know, our, our main characters. And obviously the main out of all of those is our protagonist, Sydney Prescott, who will, spoiler alert, survives this movie. She'll go on to be the main character in the rest of these films. But her mother, Maureen Prescott, was murdered a year before. And she testified, Sydney herself testified on the stand, that it was this man named Cotton Weary who did it. But there's some... There's an increasing amount of evidence that's coming out that he's actually probably going to get off because the evidence isn't strong enough to convict him, which of course would mean the real murderers, the real killers, or killers, are still out there. So her character, the character of Sydney, is having some emotional issues that are drawn from the fact that her mother was murdered and there's still these questions of like, wow, is this killer really out there? Or did we find the right guy and is he about to get off with murder? And this is something that you'll see throughout the next few movies, especially, is that uh, for me, her character sometimes gets a bit annoying. You'll see it throughout the franchise, like I say, that at times she's a bit too brooding and a bit too disconnected emotionally from everybody that's around her. Now, obviously, as these movies go on, she'll have more and more reason to be disconnected from the people around her. But I do think Nev Campbell does a fine job as Sydney. It's just sometimes Sydney's character actually kind of gets on my nerves. Some of the other main characters, uh, obviously Randy, who is the horror movie geek that works at the local movie store. Remember back when we used to go rent movies? Randy works at one of those, and he is the main supplier of what the Scream franchise is known for, and that is the meta commentary. So, for instance, he compares the killings that are happening now to things he's seen in horror movies, obviously giving us some insight, because this, of course, is a horror movie. Uh, but he'll relate things to, like he, for once, says everybody's a suspect. If the cops would just watch Prom Night, the movie Prom Night with Jamie Lee Curtis, if they would just watch that, they could save time. He says everybody is a suspect. So Randy is kind of the, the, the friend, one of the friends in the group, but he also has a crush on Sydney, wants to be with Sydney, but obviously Sydney's already in another relationship with Billy. Now, Billy is the dark and brooding boyfriend of our main protagonist. This is a guy that kind of like screams out to you, no pun intended, that he is a sociopath who's probably capable of murdering people. But I guess the movie does that. It's been so long since I've seen, I, I've seen the original Scream so many times, but it's been so long since the first time I saw Scream that I can't really remember what my mindset was about Billy because now it's all tainted. Spoiler alert again, Billy is one of the killers. It seems so obvious when you go back and watch it. But part of me thinks, did did they expect us not to notice that because it seemed so obvious? Sometimes movies do that. Obviously, Billy Loomis has a friend, Stu Mocker, who is sort of the normal, goofy, conformist party guy. Uh, he doesn't seem to have any deep character underneath the fact that he's just a he wants a good time and he's following his friends and he's kind of a kind of a dupe. He's not stupid. 
but like I say, he's more like a conformist dupe. Um, and then you have Tatum, who is the who's the sister of a deputy. I'm going to get to here in a minute. She's dating Stu, and she's also Sidney Prescott's best friend. And that basically is the group of teenage friends. You have Billy, you have Stu, you have Tatum, you have Randy, and of course you have Sidney Prescott, who is dating Billy. Uh, the other characters in the movie we get introduced to Dewey, who is Tatum's brother, who is the really young, naive, kind of goofy, clownish deputy of the town. Gail Weathers, who is played by Courtney Cox, of course, is kind of a cutthroat news reporter who is looking for the next big story to advance her career. And then, of course, you have Cotton Weary, which in this movie, Cotton Weary is, you see him a couple of times, he's mentioned, but he doesn't really get a bigger character build up until the following movie, Scream 2 especially, and then a little bit in Scream 3, but we'll get to that in the future. Again, Scream is known so much for the meta commentary, the commentary about horror movies and tropes and things that are honestly the movie kind of makes fun of some of the things that happen in horror movies and they make some good points about some of the stuff uh there's some of the stuff like sydney is said when she's on the phone with the killer that horror movies are lame they're sexist that sort of a thing why are the people too stupid to just run out the front door why do they always have to run upstairs when they're getting chased by some asshole on a mask with a knife and then obviously the movie kind of shows you at least in that particular instance why they ran up the stairs because the door was locked you couldn't get out of it fast enough so you have to find another way out and also when adrenaline's flowing some of the stuff is believable now one thing i do share with this movie about the meta commentary that i actually hate about a lot of horror movies is i hate in horror movies where the bad guys get away with stuff just because basically the screenwriter had to write it that way like if you have to make some implausible decision in a life or death situation that nobody would normally make, and that's the reason the killer keeps getting away with killing people. That's something that irritates me in movies. Like, I love gore, I love seeing bodies pile up, but I don't like seeing a killer just get away with all the murders because people are too fucking unrealistically stupid to do something smart. Now, this kind of brings me to the finale of this movie. If you see my other review of Scream 5, you'll know this is one of the beefs that I mentioned because the finale of Scream 1 is great and terrible at the same time. It's great in the sense that I like that they went with two killers. I think that's very different. That's something you don't really expect there to be two of these people. That was an interesting twist towards the end of this movie. What's horrible is that after all this brilliant structuring of all the events of the movie, and this is something that happens in the future movies as well, as soon as they take their masks off, it really is symbolic of like now they're human. But now that they've taken their masks off, now they're just people. Even though we've seen the ghost face kind of tripping around and stumbling when they're attacking their victims, now they're like full-on human. Now they're not even clever or cunning in any way. Now they're just dumb and they're going to monologue and they're going to give the protagonists and the main cast everything that they need to survive the ordeal. And that happens probably out of all the movies. This one and maybe Scream 5 are tied for the worst at that. Now, again, the finale, the twist, two killers, and it's these two friends, it's her boyfriend, all that is interesting. But what's not interesting is how they sit there and monologue until an opening comes up that now your protagonist can get away. And the opening that comes up is the two killers stabbing each other to stage the scene while they've still left their main protagonist alive. Now, obviously, anybody who's sensible would say, I'm going to make sure everyone's dead, and then now me and my friends are going to cut each other up so we can stage this whole event. They don't do that, and they pay for it with their lives. And we got four other, so far, Scream movies out of it because they're too incompetent to do what they needed to do. But that's basically the gist of Scream. So let's rate this thing and break down everything into different categories. For story, I'll give this an 8 out of 10. The story is solid. The small town of Woodsboro is experiencing a spree of murders involving high school students. We have Sydney Prescott as our main protagonist who, a year after her mother has been murdered, is still in a weird place emotionally. The killer is wearing a common Halloween costume that is virtually impossible to track down and it's sort of a whodunit, which makes it more of a horror mystery. Scream definitely falls into the slasher subgenre though, so that means we don't really need a whole lot of story happening to see the bodies pile up and to enjoy ourselves. For special effects, I'll give this a 7 out of 10. 
Well, there aren't really any that I can think of that are worth noting aside from some blood. And I have to give this movie a 7 of special effects because while there aren't many instances of special effects, this movie doesn't suffer overall from a lack of them. So I can't hate it and I can't love it for special effects. For horror, I'll give this an 8 out of 10. Scream does well enough convincing us that the events of the movie could be real. High schoolers wearing costumes and slicing each other up is certainly a possible scenario. The killers taunting their victims with phone calls, chasing them through isolated areas. Scream has a good thriller edge and keeps the audience engaged with the horror of the film. For gore, I'll give this a 6 out of 10. The gore in Scream is pretty tame by modern standards, but specifically the opening scene where Drew Barrymore's character is gutted and left hanging from a tree, that is pretty solid gore. Tatum having her neck broken by the garage door, Gail's cameraman coating the news van with blood. It's, it's really not gore that I can brag about, but it's certainly enough there to be believable. Scream is nowhere near Tarantino levels of blood, to be sure, and by modern standards, it is pretty tame. For kills, I'll give it a 7 out of 10. We have stabbings, we have guttings, throat slits, gunshots, a TV to the face, and a garage door, doggy door related death. There are pretty diverse and creative ways to die in Scream movies, and it's nice to see this in a slasher. So overall, I would give Scream a 7 out of 10. The franchise as a whole is not really my favorite thing, but it's definitely a good series to check out if you have not. It's probably one of the most consistent series or franchises in horror, which is really saying something. There's a lot of peaks and valleys in a lot of horror franchises, believe me. But this one actually stays pretty steady. There's never... Except for me. Well, we'll get to that later. We'll have to save that for a future video. Because there is one of the movies that is out that I really just absolutely do not like. But, for the most part, they stay pretty steady. Scream did a lot to revive the image of horror in the mid-90s. Which horror definitely needed after... By the end of the 80s, you had so many horror movies. So many shit horror movies. So many slashers that are just completely forgettable. And just rode the trend. And... Horror definitely needed uh, a facelift, I guess you could say. And though I wouldn't put Scream up with the slasher classics like Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th, it does deserve respect for doing what it did. Well, that's it for this one, but let me know what you guys think. Did I miss something about Scream? Did I give it too much credit? Did I give it too little credit? I would love to hear your thoughts, but I'll see you all again in the review for Scream 2. I already did a review of Scream 5, but I want to go back and review all the other Scream movies so I can rank them all on a video like I did the Halloween and Friday the 13th films. So look forward to more of those in the future, but until then, later y'all.